My name is Pete Muller. Uh, I guess in a somewhat unconventional sense as a photographer, I'm going to start off by playing a little bit of audio <laughs> that we're uh, using as part of a podcast that we're creating. The newest comprehensive report on climate change and its effects was released yesterday. The news is grim. The a giant new, new government report says climate change is already hurting the community. The UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has released a troubling report. fire in California state history. Glaciers now melt at a historic pace. A global emergency. If we do not take action quick results of climate change threat to human civilization on this planet as we know it. The place that you live in raises you in a sense and it becomes a part of you and then to see that gone you feel like you're losing the past and the future at the same time so that that voice that you hear emerging from that soundscape of disorienting warning is the voice of Callie Mooley Alexander Callie uh, was one of my students at Mount Holyoke College in Western Massachusetts this last semester. She's 20 years old. She's from a place called Doddridge County, West Virginia, which is a place that's experienced considerable environmental transformation in recent years owing to natural gas exploration. When I uh, told Callie the project that I'm working on, she stopped by my office hours wanting to share with me some of her observations about the emotional experience of watching her home change. I was quite taken aback by the poignancy of her remarks about this unique idea of losing the past and the future at the same time. And I thought that Callie's remarks really shed a lot of insight into sort of the emotional dimensions of our changing planet. For the last 18 months, I have been a photographic fellow here, uh, and I've been investigating a type of feedback loop about how the world that we are changing is in turn changing us particularly in, in an emotional sense and our connections with the environments that we know. When I proposed this story at National Geographic, I knew that the society and the magazine had been the standard bearer for disseminating information about our changing planet, particularly in its physical manifestations, about the loss of sea ice and critical species, encroachment on wild places. But my photography has always been about the contours of human challenges and experiences. And I really wanted to bring some of that spirit and approach to the pressing conversation about our relationship with the environment. So I've been traveling a lot to a number of the front lines of environmental desolation in various parts of the world with a particular eye towards the emotional and psychological experiences that people are having as they watch these changes occur in front of them. Among other places, I've been working along the Gulf Coast of Louisiana, which is a place that, of course, many of you know, uh, owing to rising sea levels and coastal erosion, has had a considerable amount of land loss in recent decades. In particular, I'm working on an island called Aldejan Charles. Some of you may have heard of this place. It's been held up as a sort of infamous case of land loss. The island, for a long time, was a, quite an idyllic place, and in some ways it still is. Of course, the residents had access to all the bounty of the sea, but they also had productive farming lands, they had hunting grounds, they had beautiful trees, uh, many of which have since died as a result of saltwater intrusion on the island. While I've been there, I've spent a lot of time with a man named Chris Brunet, who's lived on the island his whole life. And what I'd like to do is allow Chris to tell us a story uh, as we look at some of the photographs that I have made on Aldejan Charles. Things began to change whenever the land began to change. My mom, she would talk about a persimmon tree how the island had persimmon trees, and the persimmons, she loved them. Well, lo and behold, on the side of the bayou, going down, going down the little bayou, to the right across the bayou, they had a persimmon tree that had grew. And so about 1998, 2000, 2001, she went picked 
the last litter of persimmons up in there that was growing on the side of the bank near a salt water bayou. And I ate some. Talk about sweet. It was just so delicious. So that right there showed to me that there was something she did as a child that that was the last time she was going to eat persimmons from off this island. So I, th I think that Chris Brunet is one of the greatest storytellers that I've ever met, and I've met a lot. I find this particular story about the persimmon trees and his mother to be incredible. I think it's powerful, and it's poetic, and it's painful all at once. And to me, it's such a clear distillation of this quiet yet resounding sense of loss that's occurring in the lives of more and more people around the planet. Now, we hear, I hear, you all, we all hear this cacophony of warning about the, what the future of environmental change is going to mean for us. But what I'm learning is that for more and more people around the world, the effects are already here. They've arrived gradually and quietly but to quite astounding effect in the practical and emotional lives of people in these places. But the fact of the matter is, the story of Alde Jean Charles, the story that Chris tells us, these stories amount to one of the most pressing issues of our time, but these are not stories that scream. You know, these are stories that whisper. And I think if we have a hope of being able to call them out from that cacophony of disorienting, overwhelming, sometimes warning, it is so imperative that we know where and how to look and listen. For most of my photographic life, I photograph stories that scream. I photograph war and conflict, like this war in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. I photograph the horrors of the Ebola virus in West Africa. I photographed the astounding, awe-inspiring political and social tumult that unfolded in the streets of Cairo after the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak. These are stories that represent the zenith of human drama, and they lend themselves so readily to these profound, haunting, galvanizing, action-encouraging photojournalistic pictures. That's why we've entrusted the technique of photojournalism to chronicle these stories for so long. But climate change is different. It's been done this profound disservice by being both gradual and elusive. And I knew that if I wanted to explore this subject, that I was going to have to push beyond the comfort zone that I'd had for so long, that I was going to want sound and concepts and memory and time, all of those elements I'd hope would come together to augment photography in the service of understanding this sense of emotional and psychological loss that's becoming so much more prevalent for so many more people. I really hope that we can use this story, the many stories that I've been working on on my fellowship, and the stories that so many of you are telling in this room, and harness this incredible, influential, trusted platform that we have at National Geographic to, hope, to hopefully encourage the mental metabolic transformation that we need to undergo in order to successfully confront these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. Next. Thank you, Pete. Next, it's turn to hear National Geographic Fellow Shaquin Jimmy. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, the UN released its annual emissions gap report, which, as we uh, all here know, highlights the difference between what we need to do in terms of uh, curbing emissions and what we're actually doing. And I worked with them to summarize the report in this interactive and visual feature. Uh, one of the key points of the report was how to uh, keep global warming below two degrees, we needed to uh, keep greenhouse gas emissions uh, below a certain level, and they had to peak by 2020 and decrease rapidly afterwards. 
So that was not going to happen it just one, in just one, one chart. Uh, in this case, the country by country emissions. So what we did was we transitioned the visualization. So each country was a little square and with its, it, its own chart. And this way you could actually uh, rent in a, in a sort of uh, world map. This way you could actually see uh, the regional patterns and you could actually see which countries had uh, peaked already. But obviously not everyone has the same responsibility. So what, what did we do? We transitioned the chart again. And here each cell is sized by each country's contribution to the global uh, greenhouse emissions. And if they have or they have not done what they needed to be doing to curb that. Using the storytelling, um, breaking a complicated data set uh, apart, visualizing it, and guiding people through it is a very effective way of communicating. So emissions have to peak by a certain uh, year. Uh, most countries in developing countries in Asia and Africa haven't, but they're not uh, as big as the biggest contributors, who, some of which have not done what they need to be doing to curb um, climate change. So that was fine. We understand what those squiggly lines mean, what those unevenly sized squares are, but we were lacking the emotional connection. You care about this little green dot because your brain is wired to see the sequence as a narrative. You can read protagonists and antagonists in, in this. So that is what I do. I work to make data tangible and relatable using text and using visuals and using uh, uh, metaphors and using interaction. Uh, my ultimate goal is to present data in terms audiences can feel. Um, last July, the world celebrated World Environment Day around the issue of beating plastic pollution. And I worked with the UN to, to create this interactive and, and visual feature around it. As the opener, we show the geometric growth of plastic waste at this, uh, as this uh, visual of raining trash. We transformed the data in this small red chart um, here in something more tangible uh, into this rate of raining chart that was changing uh, based on the, on the data for that decade. And as I was working on this, my four-year-old son walked into the room and said, Daddy, why is it raining more and more trash? And so even though he doesn't read, he doesn't have the tools to read, and he didn't have the context, so he couldn't have the full picture, he could, he could read what was happening uh, here. We respond much more immediately to data if it's presented in these raw terms. And then we can be guided through the nuance and through uh, the details. But data becomes more memorable uh, this way. Because it's not about the data, it's not about the abstraction, it's not about uh, the numbers, it's about who is behind that or who is affected by that. Uh, by the way, another uh, little uh, uh, anecdote with my four-year-old. As I was working on this uh, presentation uh, last week, uh, he 
uh, he walks in and I ask him, uh, Roy, so what is it more important, this or this? And he said, obviously this. And when I asked him why, he said, well, because it's people. He can read. Bear in mind, he can read. Uh, so he, but he has more uh, clearer than uh, some data journalists what is more important. It's, it's, the, <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the numbers, it's the people uh, behind it. So taking all that into account, making data about uh, people, uh, weaving, uh, hooking you emotionally, and weaving narrative to show you the details um, and the nuance was what we did in 2017 for the UN Environment Assembly. We start counting the number of people that die because of an unhealthy environment and climate change as soon as you open the story. Somebody in the Western Pacific is going to die in two, one, That gets me every time I do it. Um, and we then call to action. How do we stop it? And then we show you the nuance and the detail and more data and the reasons behind it. But we have hooked you emotionally first. We've put it in terms that you can relate to. Uh, we listen and tell stories from a very young age. It's a very human tool to understand the world around us. Uh, and I think that paired with this data-driven, um, evidence-based, emotional, and visual approach, uh, we can get audiences to care and act about the issues we know they care about. Thank you. Gracias, Shaquin. Our last panelist presenting is National Geographic grantee, Arati Kumar Rao. Imagine, imagine you're asleep in a house near a river. The river is the Ganges. It's a warm July night and it begins to rain, drizzle at first, and then heavier and heavier. And then there's thunder and lightning. And suddenly you wake up. You hear the sound of people running, running outside your house. And you just step out to see your neighbors running helter-skelter. Some have got kids in their arms. Some have picked up everything that they could gather. One man has a television on his head. And they're all running. You run too. You run and run until you're soaked to the skin. And then you stop. The next morning reveals this. The Ganges has taken half your neighborhood again for the 17th time. And this time, the Ganges is at your doorstep. Why? Why would a river gulp kilometers of paddy fields and turn it into this? Why? Why would a river chew through its own bank and push the people that live on it so far inland until they have nowhere to go? We're landlords to bed and beggars to rise, they say. They have been internally displaced several times over. It used to not be like this. Rivers do meander. In their floodplains, all rivers meander, and there's some amount of erosion that all of these people know to live with. But something changed. Something changed four decades ago. What changed? India built a barrage at a place called Faraka. Why? Ostensibly to flush the port of Calcutta, which was downstream, of the silt that was building up. Now, what the engineers did not calculate was that, was two things. One, that this is a tidal delta. Calcutta sits on a tidal delta. The tide comes in with 78 times the amount of water any Faraka barrage can push, push out. So of course, the silt was going nowhere. And secondly, we are talking about the siltiest river on Earth, the Ganges. You don't just build a dam and forget about it. 
because the silt will build up behind the dam, and it did. It built up to such an extent that it raised the riverbed, and the river had nowhere to go, and it was finding places to go. Its right bank was rocky. There was no, it found no perches there. So it swung to the left, and what was there? Mango orchards, paddy fields, houses, homesteads, markets, hospitals, all built on soft soil. And of course, it just chewed its way through, scarfing its way down, leaving hundreds of thousands of people homeless over the years. Oftentimes, it's not the river that devastates, but what we do to it that does. And these people now, shorn of their traditional livelihood, shorn of their identity, shorn of any agency, have to migrate. Have to migrate to already stuffed cities looking for daily wage work, which then exposes them to the vagaries of market forces. And those that are left behind, they are left to eke out a living out of nothing in desperately devastated landscapes. With no income and no livelihood, what do they do? They marry off their children early, so there's child marriage, which is rampant. And every child above the age of six is forced into labor, child labor. Malnourishment is on the rise. Infant mortality rate and maternal mortality rate are off the charts in these places. But here's the rub. What that barrage did was not limited to this area that it was built around. Let's zoom out and take a 30,000 foot view of the lower basin of the Ganges. South of the barrage is the Sundarbans, the largest unbroken stand of mangroves in the world, a richly biodiverse region, which depends on a delicate balance of sweet water and salt water for its survival. And what does the barrage do? It holds back sweet water, it diverts it. With less fresh water coming, out of, coming downstream, brine takes over and it's creating havoc. Salinity is almost destroying the Sundarbans. And silt. What happens when you hold back silt in an active delta? The delta is built with silt. It requires that silt to fortify itself against rising sea levels and increasing storm surges that are coming. You hold back silt and you undermine the resilience of this delta. And you threaten millions of people that live on it. And then there's the fish. There used to be, there, there still is, an anadromous fish that swims upstream to, swan, to spawn, but it can't reach its spawn grounds anymore. And the fisheries have collapsed. Lucrative fisheries have collapsed and plunged fishermen deep into debt. This is the most populated river basin in the world, and generation after generation of children are growing up sans any education, any hospitals, no healthcare, no prospects, no livelihood. This is India's vaunted demographic dividend. As chroniclers, we have an immense responsibility and indeed an opportunity to understand the land and to smash those silos of narrow departmental thinking that actually led to something like a faraka, which should never be repeated. Stories have the power. They have the power to illuminate interconnected dependencies in a biogeographic region that goes beyond political boundaries. And they can push for policies that may never ever compromise the resilience of a land and its denizens, both human and no non-human, no matter what nature throws at them. Thank you. Thank you, Arthi. Thank you. So we're going to start our conversation, and for that, I want to welcome back Shakina and Pete. Thank you all for those amazing presentations. So we're talking about exposing the boundaries of climate change. And all of you have different techniques. You're tackling the story from different angles. But I feel you all have in common that you want to cut the noise, really connect people with the story, and trigger some action. 
So my first big question to all of you is, one day you wake in the morning and say, I'm going to work on climate change, one of the most abstract and difficult issues. <laughs> so what, how, how did you, were motivated? Were you hesitant about doing this? What, what really motivates you to work on this topic? Me? We can start with <laughs> <a bit. laughs> uh, I was terrified. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, I, I think the incremental uh, aspect of climate change and environmental degradation issues is profound in terms of trying to distill this. You know, mm -hmm. things happen so gradually and you have this issue of like shifting baseline. People are, are, are gradually getting more and more used to their surroundings. Yeah. So for me as a photographer, Photogra you know, particularly photojournalistic pictures hinge on action. Mm -hmm. So it was a tremendous challenge to start thinking about how I could be fleshing out the dimensions, not only of something that was that incremental, mm -hmm. but particularly because of these abstract notions, increasingly abstract notions that mm -hmm. I was interested in about these emotional dimensions of people's mm -hmm. inner feelings about what's happening outside them. So I took an integrated approach where I'm making a podcast mm -hmm. and br bringing those stories back so that there can be that sort of mm -hmm. complementary uh, interaction. What about you, Shaki? Uh, well, I mean, it's simply the most important story of our generation. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I was working at the, at the Guardian, we, we, were, um, we were running this campaign of uh, keeping it in the ground because um, uh, our, our boss, Alan Resbridger, thought that we were failing as journalists to communicate that uh, the urgency of climate change. And the way the way um, the way I see it, our contribution as uh, data visualizers is that there's so much, there's such a wealth of data, and there is mm -hmm. such a lack of understanding of how urgent this is and how important it is for us to act now. Mm -hmm. That uh, presenting this evidence in a in a way that people can connect, that people can have uh, an emotional reaction, and hopefully. Uh, trigger them to to act and to make better decisions when they have to go to the polls or when they have to um, make decisions in their every, uh, everyday uh, life. I thought it was um, very important and very um, necessary. Absolutely. You, Ati? Um, I have been following uh, the lives of landscapes and uh, what I was noticing is that the changes that we're bringing about in the landscapes was undermining resilience and, um, and increasing the vulnerability of people. Mm -hmm. And I realized that imminent as it is, um, climate change is something that's going to sit as a layer above mm -hmm. the inequities on the ground. And so for me, that I felt that the more proximal causes of what's happening on the ground and how people are being affected mm -hmm. was really important to highlight. Mm -hmm. Because yes, climate change is coming, but it's going to be what's happening here on the ground right now and it's, it's, that matters. Okay. So that was my motivation. Yeah, absolutely. So we were backstage and I was talking to Pete about this concept that he often uses about mental metabolism, and which I find fascinating. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about how this concept is related to this work you're doing with climate change? So uh, I'm doing an array of things to try to cover this. I'm, I'm making these, uh, journeys to, to various places along the front lines of, of change, but I'm also working with a number of experts. Mm -hmm. uh, one of whom is a, a really interesting woman named Lisa Feldman Barrett, who's one of the leading experts, neuroscientific experts, on how our brains construct emotion. And that's a, sort of a complicated uh, uh, field. And Lisa loves to bake. Um, so she makes these really helpful baking analogies where she talks about how you know, a lot of what she discusses is about notions of social reality and concepts in our mind. So she talks about muffins and, cu and cupcakes and how essentially a muffin and a cupcake are in essence the same thing. But we have a profound culturally specific notion of social reality that if you had a cupcake for breakfast, it would be kind of like a cr an insane thing to do if everything was okay in your life. But we would classify a muffin, maybe not in 2018, but as like part of a sort of healthy breakfast. <laughs> um, but what Lisa says is that Interestingly, on the basis of that social reality, that cycle, that neurological distinction that we make, there's actually a physiological reaction, a difference in the way that we metabolize those two items, which 
got me thinking that if we, you know, we have all of this ambient emotional connection to issues of environmental change yeah. that has not been clearly defined in any way. And more and more of the people that I'm talking to are helping to me to define, I'm working with a scholar who's thinking about defining things and giving names to things. And I got to wondering that if this principle that Lisa describes about mm -hmm. this difference in metabolic process on the basis of this social, this social reality between these things, if that could happen with our understanding, if we could trace out something more clear out of this ambient noise around our feelings of climate change, could that change our mental metabolism in the way that we process and turn that information into mm -hmm. solutions and action outside of ourselves? Absolutely. I think I was reading one of your articles and you use also as Pete has his own concept, you use a concept that you call slow violence. And you talk about this slow violence that is being inflicted in communities, not only by climate change, but also by environmental degradation. Can you talk to us a little bit more about this so slow violence? That sure. Uh, slow violence is a term that was coined by Rob Nixon. And uh, it basically is, the, is like the antithesis of a war. A war, you know, it, it creates headlines. It's spectacular. And then, you know, there's gore and blood and all of that. A slow violence is... Um, is different, it's, it's accretive, it's cumulative over years. It takes, a, it takes, it's like a slow burn. It unfolds over generations. It unfolds over space and time. So for example, um, it, in, the, in, in the case that I just showed, the dam, it was constructed in 1971 and you didn't begin to see the effects mm -hmm. of it for almost 10, 15 years after that. And now, 47 years after that, you're still seeing effects of it. So that is, is a perfect example of slow violence. It's basically killing one day at a time, you know, slowly, really slowly. Super strong concept. One th question that I have for you, that we were also talking about it early in the morning, is uh, I was reading another article that said that understanding the tipping point it's really important in order for us to understand what is at stake with climate change and that we don't cross those tipping points because otherwise it is a mess. But every time I think about tipping points, I think about numbers, lines, charts, graphs, things that for me is extremely hard to understand. So what do you think about using those tipping points and how do you translate those tipping points in, in visual data that people can understand? I think, I think uh, the, the beauty of, um, of data visualization uh, and is that we can actually draw those uh, tipping points. Yeah. You, uh, unlike, uh, we have a, um, we're lucky compared to, to photographers um, who, who can, who are taking what it's there in in the world, we can we can show what's the future that's coming and how that future mm -hmm. um, like would could look like. We have we have a freedom to to visualize things that that I'm sorry you guys don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but the thing the thing is we can because we can actually draw those uh, those tipping points. We've been dr drawing them without framing them. Mm -hmm. in what we were talking about uh, earlier, that, that sense of urgency. If we cross this tipping point, mm -hmm. we're screwed, yeah. uh, for lack of a better word. Um, and and what, what, we, what we need to be doing is um, think, think about uh, framing them in terms that people can actually react to. We, can, we have to uh, forget about those numbers that you were talking about uh, before, uh, those abstractions, and mm -hmm. actually do the the intellectual work of figuring out what is the the metaphor, either visual metaphor or the interactive uh, or the interaction that is going to make a person connect to that concept. Exactly. So, for the sake of all of the audience, because I think see a full room, I'm going to open because I can go like this, non-stop service, asking questions. So I'm sure that there are many questions in the room. So I think we have mics. Yes, we have mics. So questions in the room for our panel? None? Ah, I see one there. Spectacular work, um, Andy Revkin. Um, this is for Aradi, I think. Um, 
mostly. What's really cool about what you've done there, and I assume what you're still doing, is that you've identified the systemic nature of the vulnerability. But those are really hard stories to tell. In our, how does that play out in terms of where you end up wanting your content to be and how you want it to be reacted to, both in, in locally in India and globally? You, you hit upon the, the biggest challenge with slow violence. How do you actually make people excited about it? Because you have nothing really to show. It's so accretive and it's so long term that it's really hard. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we are, I've just begun this kind of work. And um, so this is something that we have to probably attack from various prongs. And, um, and I do believe that um, using art, theater, and reaching policymakers in any way possible that actually speaks their language uh, will, needs to happen. It really needs to happen because as you correctly said, it's systemic. I just showed you one instance. If I were to map on India, just India alone, the places that this was happening, you'd be astounded. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, you just have to plug at it because unfortunately, there are none so blind as those who refuse to see mm -hmm. and you just have to keep at it. Any other question? Nobody? Ah, I see one. one over there. Where is it mine? There you go. Uh, hey, folks. Um, just even on that last note, uh, um, about those who refuse to see and thinking about, you know, making emotional appeals, uh, using data to make emotional appeals as well. I'm curious uh, how you think we can best have the conversation with folks who their emotions uh, are in the opposite direction, or they, they really do have a legitimate self-interest to oppose uh, work to combat climate change, whether it's their own financial interests uh, because of their jobs their, uh, or, or whatever else. Uh, how do we have those conversations? I can, I can, um, there's, I think, I think that uh, one, of, one of the things that I was saying in, in the talk is that um, this data-driven and evidence-based uh, stories are, are good to mobilize people to, to act. The problem is, what do we choose to talk about in this evidence-based, data-driven uh, format? The problem when someone has uh, a completely different view, if one person has a completely different view from, from you, is that if we buy into that narrative and we provide fact-checking against that narrative, we actually, I think, we actually are having a problem because we're not uh, surpassing things. We're, we're debating against things that uh, should not be debated. I think we have to have uh, keep moving things uh, forward and try to reach uh, the biggest, the, cr the most critical mass of, of people that we, can, that we can mobilize to, to action. And I am, I'm sorry, but if someone has a very strong uh, opposite opinion towards uh, what is the urgency of climate change, I think binding to their narrative and providing data against uh, that narrative is the wrong uh, approach. I wanted to say that because uh, maybe somebody else can have a, a different uh, perspective here. Something to add, I can read. read. I, I, I've had uh, what I think have been some interesting experiences uh, both in the United States and Australia and the components that I've, uh, two of the components that I've done for this project where the people uh, living in the place of that particular form of environmental desolation are people who would regard themselves. I had one guy in Australia tell me, I would have placed myself somewhere right of Attila the Hun uh, in my former life before this major transformation of the environment that I've witnessed over the last 20 years. And that has really enlightened, us, at least a side of me, that prior to ex this experience, I may have aligned myself against it. But this has brought it home to me in a way that's really pushed me into becoming, you know, this guy's a very avowed environmental activist, not only on his cause, but on an array of others. And I, what I hope to impart a little bit is taking some of those voices of people who've had that sort of transformation on the basis of their experience and share that with others uh, so that we can see how this sort of cuts across. I mean, you say what you want, but when it really comes to roost, 
uh, people tend to change their tune. Great. I know we have one more question, but now we're running out of time. So we'll take a quick last question. There's one here and one back there. So. Hi, I'm, I'm just wondering how you uh, raise the alarm without becoming alarmist and sort of keep a semblance of hope mm -hmm. in some of these stories because I, you know, it's easy to get totally depressed and unen unengaged on the other side about some mm -hmm. of these things. Um, so, yes, absolutely. And I, in fact, um, I often joke with my friends that I never have any good news for them when I come back from field. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but truly, um, there, there is hope. Um, it's, it's, it's to do with listening to the land. I really keep coming back to the land because that really is the way, to, way forward. Um, and uh, interestingly, in India, and I'm speaking only for India, um, there, are, there are enough people now, or there, are, there seem to be more and more people who are uh, realizing that. And why? Because it's now coming home to roost. Uh, the, the city I live in, Bangalore, it's, it's suffering, it's hurting. And the people there um, are, are beginning to realize now that, yes, we have to listen to the land. You can't be sitting on a rock which is in an arid area and then you know, have a booming population and swimming pools and you know, just take all the water that you need. So um, it really comes down to that. And um, when people begin to realize that, even if it's one person or two people, and I talk a lot to young students, and I see, I see that they get it. Um, there's hope in that, and uh, that, that's the only way to keep going, really. Mm. So, I, thank you. I want to thank you for, for showing us your work, for doing this amazing work in such a difficult but really important topic. And I want to ask for an applause of the audience to say goodbye to our... <laughs> thank you. <laughs>